him being like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. All right. Good morning, everybody. If you have a copy of God's Word, um, like was mentioned, I want to encourage you to open it up to uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue in our series that we've been calling Follow Me. Now, um, I will tell you, uh, every time I do a new slideshow and kind of prep it for Sunday morning, it kind of automatically gives a new name to the slideshow. And this one said, Follow Me number 20. So we're well on our way um, in the Gospel of Matthew. We've taken a little bit of a um, winding path through this Gospel, but today we find ourselves in chapter 3, 13 through 17. And, um, you know, last Sunday, uh, we basically began exploring chapters 3 and 4. And I, I reminded you that chapters 1 and 2 is kind of Jesus' origin story. We did that at Christmas time. And then chapters 3 and 4 are Jesus' like preparation for ministry section. So they, these, ch these chapters explore Jesus' preparation for ministry. In last week's text, um, verses 1 through 12 of chapter 3, we discovered that John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus' presence and his work among the people of God. And uh, from the story of John the Baptist, we learned some principles of preparation, as specifically as it relates to revival. You know, we learned that there are things that we can do today each day to prepare for the power and the presence of Jesus and the revival of God's people. And so um, basically, John first steps outside the religious systems uh, and religious norms into the wilderness of the world, and he builds his life in the wilderness to show that the way of Jesus is not through like dead and self-righteous religious practice, but instead begins with examination and repentance. So we discovered that preparation for rev the revival of God's people involves an unadulterated message. So we talked about um, this detaching from just dead, lifeless religious systems and truly embracing the message of John the Baptist that ultimately became the message of Jesus. And that message was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we, we learned that water baptism is a, a sign or a demonstration of true and personal repentance. And then we learned at the end of last week's text that the work of Jesus in those who repent and who are baptized is to fill us with the Spirit of God and to set on fire all that we were so that His life and uh, might emerge in us and through us in the world around us. And so that was kind of the general gist of last week. This morning, we're exploring the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And um, in this text, um, we're going to hear Jesus give reason for his baptism. Um, he's going to say, and we're going to explore this further later on in our teaching time this morning, that it was to fulfill all righteousness. That's why he came. Which means, in essence, to complete that every, everything that forms an obedient relationship with God. Now, we're going to talk about this, but this is a big deal. Because throughout human history, from Adam and Eve and their fall, all the way through the Old Testament people, there's been a desire and an effort to be the obedient, righteous people of God by the people of God that failed over and over and over and over and over and over and over, if you read the Old Testament. And you soon come to realize that the problem is that they've been given a law, but their hearts are the same. Their hearts have not been changed. And so what Christ has come to do, just giving you the under the hood really quick at the beginning, Christ has come in order to save us, but also to empower his people to be the sort of people whose hearts are changed from the inside and that obedience comes springing out by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we're trying to do in our flesh, in our willfulness. It's a work that the Spirit does. And that's what Christ means when he said, I came to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, I came to make it possible. Not just possible, but because the Spirit's in you, probable. Not just probable, but guaranteed. That if 
You come to faith in Jesus that you will be forgiven and know the righteousness of Christ through forgiveness, but you will also be filled with the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God will lead you in all obedience because you've been changed from the inside out. So that's kind of the synopsis of our time together this morning. As a matter of fact, um, let, let me give us kind of a, a big idea for this morning that kind of springs from that. You know, um, Jesus, through his baptism, demonstrated the path for us that we must take to know the right, righteousness of God. And so we're going to look at that path illustrated through Jesus' baptism. But a big idea for this morning is this. Jesus' baptism reveals the way. It shows the way to what true and full life of repentance looks like. So Jesus' baptism reveals the way. Um, I don't know. Anybody in here watch The Mandalorian on Disney Plus? Anybody in here? I know as soon as I said the big idea, probably like a third of the people in the room were like, there you go. This is the way. You know, I, I like that show. You know, I'm not like up here endorsing it necessarily, but I do. I enjoyed it. And it's, it's one of those shows where you've got this guy, he has a particular culture, a particular way. He always wears his armor. And every time he comes in, contra- in, in contact with somebody who's questioning whether or not he ought to be who he is or he ought to wa- wear what he wears or do what he does, he says, this is the way. Well, this morning, we're going to explore the way. We're going to explore the way that Um, God has called us to take the path that Christ is leading us in to be Christ in the world around us. You know, Mandalorian's wearing the helmet. He's wearing all these sort of things. But for us, like, we're wearing Christ. We are Christ. And Christ this morning, through his baptism, demonstrates the way. You know what I mean? So let's dive into the text this morning to be reminded by Jesus of the work God has done in each of us. And here's the truth. Like, if you're here this morning and you're uncertain about whether you know Jesus Christ, today's going to be a day where hopefully, by the power of the Spirit, some things become clear to you. But if you are in Christ Jesus this morning, I think it's a day where you reflect on the baptism of Jesus and you find yourself thankful and worshipful for what Christ has done in you. So that's, that's where we're headed. So let's dive into the text this morning and be reminded of what Jesus, um, be reminded by Jesus of the work that God has done in each of us. Let's begin in verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. I, I don't know if you remember. But over the course of Christmas, we worked the first couple of chapters. You got to the very end of chapter 2. Where do we leave Jesus? Like the last time we've seen Jesus in Matthew was at the end of chapter 2. And at that time, he was probably five or six years old. He was maybe two or three years old when the wise men came. And then Joseph and Mary and Jesus fled um, to Egypt because King Herod was coming to kill all the babies. You remember that story? Then Herod dies. Um, History tells us that he dies just a few years after Jesus was in Bethlehem. And so he dies and um, they return um, to Galilee. And um, basically the text ends and Jesus is back in Nazareth in the the, uh, region of Galilee. And we're left to assume because we jump to chapter three and here at the end, Jesus shows up that Jesus has grown up in Galilee, the son of a carpenter, kind of a simple life. Maybe the last 20 or 25 years, he's hung out in Galilee and grown, grown up. We don't have a lot on that portion of his life. Um, at some point, um, we know that it's likely that his earthly father dies because Joseph never is mentioned again in Scripture. M- Mary is, but Joseph is never mentioned. And so they return from Egypt. He grows up. He lives his life. And... Um, On this day that we get to here where he shows up with John the Baptist, he probably traveled over the course of a couple of days, 25 or 30 miles from his home. It's not like he was just like walking by the Jordan River. Nobody just walked by this part of the Jordan River. Jesus comes to see John, comes to have his ministry and his life announced in the world. So Jesus shows up at the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing, and he comes to be revealed as the long awaited Messiah. This is Jesus' intention. As a matter of fact, you can write that down. Like, Jesus' baptism reveals Jesus as the long-awaited 
Messiah. That's one of the purposes for which Jesus was baptized, to reveal who he is and his purposes in the world. Jesus' baptism reveals him as the long-awaited Messiah. Just before verse 13, you may remember this, John, from last week, John explains what is about to happen. He says in verse 11 and 12, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming, there's somebody coming right around the corner after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He is going to show up and baptize you, not just with water, but with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat, that is, those who truly repent, into the barn. But the chaff, those who don't truly repent, he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John set this up. I'm baptizing with water to show repentance and demonstrate people, uh, give people an opportunity to demonstrate their repentance. But Jesus is coming, and he's not just going to do an external demonstration of repentance. He's going to fill you with fire and change your life. If you, don't, if you don't remember some of the things we talked about last week, I want to encourage you to go back online. I think it's on YouTube. Dig into that from last week. It'll provide a little bit of context for our time together this morning. So remember, Jesus is John's relative. Do you remember that? Like, John's mom and Jesus' mom are related. Both Jesus and John grow up in Galilee, and I imagine, this is maybe a little bit of a leap, but they're family and they grew up in the same region. I imagine they likely knew each other, maybe from the playground. You know, hey, Jesus, knuckle bump. What's up, John? Good to see you. To the people, John was kind of this weird son of a priest. Now, for those of you who are weird sons of pastors and preachers, our daughters, I apologize for that, you know. But John was, I'm not saying that your future is like honey and eating bugs in the wilderness, but I'm just saying, you know, it's not sure what what hope you have. So to the people, John was like the weird son of a priest who's like hanging out in the wilderness in uh, in animal skins. And Jesus is the son of a common carpenter. He grows up strong, young man, um, working with, with the tools. You know, crowds are coming out to hear John, the strange, the strange guy calling for repentance, teach and be baptized. So he's got all of these crowds. And here comes Jesus, the carpenter. At this point, no one's revealed that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. There's John, the weird guy, baptizing by the water. And here Jesus is, kind of slides in, and he just gets in line. This, this is in my own imagination. You know, John's baptizing. He's doing his thing. And Jesus kind of steps in, common carpenter, hanging out. He gets in line. And somewhere along the line, John's baptizing. He's doing his thing. And he looks up and he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. And this moment's kind of a big deal. John announces that he's not the Messiah, but that the one who is coming, is mightier, whose sandals John's not even worthy to carry. In essence, John is saying, this guy is going to separate the repentant from the unrepentant. He's going to cast the unrepentant into hell. And so he's just, he said that, and here's Jesus kind of standing in line, right? The promised Messiah, the one with all the power, the one with all the authority, the Son of God. Then Jesus walks up and You know, no disciples, no fanfare, nothing special. And the Gospel of John gives us a little more detail on the exchange than the the Gospel of Matthew does. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 31 say, The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. Maybe he wasn't in line. Maybe he was just walking along. And said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That guy right there is of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. What an entrance. You know, this isn't like theme music like the rock, but it's quite an entrance at the Jordan River. Can you imagine? It would be kind of like us being gathered here today and in the middle of the song set, Matt Newman saying, Philip Shababy, that's the Messiah. You know, it's like, what? You know, what just happened here? Um, I don't know. Philip Shababy is definitely not the Messiah. Philip's here. Glad for him. He's a good friend, but he's not the Messiah. But um, it would be like him saying, behold the Lamb of God. Here comes this 
this person who takes away the sins of the world. In the Gospel of John, we hear John the Baptist declare Jesus the Lamb of God and also say that the purpose for which John was baptizing the desert was to prepare the way for Jesus and reveal him to the world. This is why Jesus, John is working. Jesus' baptism is, in essence, John says, Jesus is unveiling. It's his presentation. It's his, here he is. This is the Christ. Imagine being there for this. Like you're in line and Jesus walks up and he's standing next to you in the crowd. The person in the line for, uh, in front of you and behind you, you know, there's Jesus. Maybe you're right in front of him, maybe right behind him. And John says, that's the Lamb of God right there, the Messiah. The one who will take away the sins of the world. The one who will separate the repentant from the unrepentant. This revelation and declaration of Jesus' identity. I think John has set this up in such a way that it requires a response. Now, all the people in the crowd, there's a whole story that unfolds. Jesus showing himself to, himself to be who he is. He's still going to go through the desert and be tempted by the devil. He's going to launch his ministry. But here's the thing. All of that we've seen, all of that we've heard. And here's the truth for us. When who Christ is is revealed to us, a response is required. When who Christ is, is revealed to us, a response is required, a reckoning of sorts. If Jesus is just kind of some guy in the crowd, we can kind of go, eh, you know? But we have all of the New Testament, the rest of the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the life of Christ, the coming of the Spirit, the unfolding of the early church. We have all of that in God's word. The guys in the line might be going, okay, John, this is just a guy. He's a carpenter. But we have what they don't have. We have the life of Christ that is unfolded before our eyes. And when Christ shows up in our space and in our world and in our lives and he says, I am the Christ, when that is revealed to us, there is a response that is required. There is a reckoning that's coming to our hearts. Here's the thing. A whole lot of people come face to face with the truth about Jesus, but few people respond rightly. A whole lot of people come face to face with Jesus, but few respond rightly. As a matter of fact, there are many people in every church who have been coming face to face with the truth about Jesus every week, but have not responded rightly. There are only, there's only one right response to the revelation of Jesus' identity. Only one right response. And John told us in last week's text what it was. He, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when we come face to face with the truth of who Jesus is, there's one right, resp right response. To repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Write this down as truth number two. Jesus' baptism affirms John's ministry and message of repentance. Jesus' baptism, it affirms John's ministry and the message of repentance. So we talked about this last week, but John's message, um, the message of both John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 2, and of Jesus, you know, repeated in, in Matthew 4, 17 was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when Jesus shows up to be baptized, the purposes of John's ministry was fulfilled. To introduce the Messiah and the Messiah's message. Like, that's John's function. But affirmation is, is kind of the two-way street here. You know, John is there to declare, this is the Christ. But... Um, Jesus' presence, him showing up in the, by the water and allowing John to baptize him, demonstrates the truthfulness of John's message, especially, given another chapter, Jesus is repeating the message that John has been declaring. So there's this mutual sort of um, validation that's happening. John's saying, that's the Christ, that's the Lamb of God. But in coming to, be, to submit himself to the baptism of John, Jesus is saying the message that guy's been preaching is the message. It's the message. And then very soon after, we see Jesus beginning to declare, right at the end of his two chapters of preparation, the same message that John the Baptist um, preached, that God was calling his people. And, you know, the place Jesus declared the message first was in a place that was not among God's people. Um, 
God was, call, was, was basically initiating this message among the people of God and even among the nations and calling them to repentance. You know, repentance is really the only right response to Jesus. People respond to Jesus in a lot of different ways. They go, well, that's nice, right? I mean, you know people who have come face to face with Jesus and they're like, he's a nice guy. You know, he was a good, good man. He was a good teacher. You know, if Jesus was just a good teacher, he, there's no power there. But if Jesus was the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world, the Messiah, there's a reckoning that must happen. Repentance is the only right response to the truth about who Jesus is. The sort of repentance that turns away from my plans, from my autonomy, from my own authority from my willfulness, from my sinfulness, to the person of Jesus um, Christ. This is repentance. We talked about it last week. The message of John, the message of Jesus was repent. Repentance means to turn from the direction I was going to the person of Christ and as Christ changes me into the work and kingdom of Christ Jesus so we're turning away from who we were to Christ. Repentance means surrendering, surrendering my life to the authority and plans and saving grace of the King of Kings. In repentance, we say, not my way, not my truth, not my life, but yours, Jesus. Yours. To the degree that we embrace the life and work of Jesus' forever kingdom. Repentance means a turning away of autonomy, of self-direction, of self-power, of willfulness, and, and turning away from our sin, and turning to Jesus and life in his church and a life lived through the church in the world as we work together to unfold the global kingdom of Jesus on earth. Repentance is, is more than just a head belief that we trust will wash us clean. It is a turning away from who we were to the person and work and life of Jesus Christ. So let, let's get real for just a second. Maybe you thought, well, we were, we're being pretty real up to now, but let's get real for just a second. This repentance requires the Holy Spirit um, humble our hearts. Can we just kind of get in each other's business for a minute? Write this down. It's truth number three. You know, Jesus' baptism reveals the humble surrender needed for someone to be saved. Now, if you're in a room today and you're saved, like you truly are redeemed, God has humbled your heart. The Holy Spirit has humbled your heart. Because to lay down willfulness, sinfulness, autonomy, self-direction, to step away from all those things and say you are in charge, something has to happen. Something comes to bear on us that leads us to recognize I am not and he is. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit leading us to repentance. Jesus' baptism reveals the humble surrender needed for someone to be saved. You know, the work of the Holy Spirit in those who are being saved is a humbling work. The truth is that we've been, I don't know about you, I've been, we've been fighting for ourselves since the day we were born. We came sliding into the world and it's like, yeah! you know, that's how life starts, right? There's a rare baby that life doesn't start that way. We've been fighting for ourselves. It's like feed me, diaper me, take care of me, and every two and a half hours do it again, right? We've been fighting for ourselves from the very, it's funny, right? You know. And uh, the truth is, we've been fighting for ourselves since the day we were born. We've been walking our own way. We've been making our own plans. We've been seeking to determine our own way of life. We've been building our own dreams. But the Spirit comes and begins to work in our hearts, begins to show us who Christ is, and begins to prepare the soil of our hearts to respond in true repentance to the revelation of Jesus Christ, of who he is. So what does that look like? Jesus shows us. I love the exchange between Jesus and John here at the first couple of verses of this baptism story. Verses 13 through 15 say, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. We already know that feels upside down. We know it feels backwards from where we sit. You know, and then it goes on and says, John would have prevented him. Even John was like, this is out of order, man. 
You can't be baptized. I can't be baptizing you um, saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. But Jesus answered him. Jesus says this to you. You better listen. Let it be so now. Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. We talked about that a minute ago just a little bit. And then John consented. John said, okay, we'll do it. You said so, we'll do it. You know, when you think about John and Jesus, who, you know, from the people in the crowd's perspective, John had all authority. John, you know, they, they were trying to figure out who this Jesus was. But from where we sit, from God's perspective, Jesus had all the rights and deserved all the glory and had all the power, but he shows up by the Jordan River to be baptized by John by a smelly guy who's like his third cousin, who's wearing animal skins, and his breath smells like honey and bugs. Like, John's initial response was to say, no, Jesus, no, I need to be baptized by you. You know, I think there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, I'm not sure John wanted to be, I'm pretty sure that John wanted to be, he's been preaching this message, baptized by the Spirit and with fire. That's been John's message. There's a guy coming. He's the one. He's going to baptize by the Spirit and by fire. And so when John says, I don't want to be putting you in the water. I want you to pour the Spirit out on me. Baptize me, Jesus. You're the one with the power. You're the one that ought to be doing this. But the truth also is, I think, that baptism it is, a, it is a demonstration. Jesus, throughout this story of his baptism, is demonstrating to to John, to the crowd around them, and to us what true obedience looks like, what a true and humble response to Christ looks like, what true repentance looks like. Jesus wanted to model what coming to faith in him and walking with him looks like from beginning to end. And Jesus models for us in this story a humility that the Holy Spirit is bringing our hearts to as God is leading us into true repentance. He's leading us to a place where we say, I am not, I cannot, I am hopeless, I am powerless, take a hold of me. You know, we believe in our church in baptism by immersion. And we think it's most biblically faithful for a few reasons, in part because the word in the Bible for baptism literally means to be submersed. And uh, we think immersion is the best picture of what happened. And also, we believe that immersion is the best picture of what happens when we're saved. And so there's the reality that the word baptism, like, implies submersion. But we also think that baptism by immersion demonstrates a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a much clearer way than any other form of baptism. I want to invite you to think about that for just a second, especially as it relates to humility and surrender, When you're baptized by immersion, don't you know you're putting your life in someone else's hands? Have you ever thought about that? Like we usually put all the focus on the person that's being baptized. But you realize like most of the time, the person that's filled with the Holy Spirit, that's a Christian, that's doing the baptizing. It could be a pastor, it could be an elder, it could be anybody in the church for for that matter. I mean, Scripture calls um, us to make disciples and baptize them. I mean, you can't really like rip out the baptizing part unless you're going to rip out the making disciples and the teaching them part. So we all have this role. I have a little bit of a looser like view personally on who could and should baptize. But I think it needs to be a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit in the context of the local church, right? But think about it. That person is representing the Lord. Their hands on you. They're representing the Lord. And you sit down in that water and you're saying, my, my life is in your hands, You're submitting and allowing that person to have authority over your life. The baptizer is taking hold of you like God takes a hold of us when we repent. You are submitting to the baptizer's control and allowing him or her to put you under the water. I mean, water represents death. Nobody that ever fell off a ship in the middle of the ocean made it, okay? It leads to death. If you go under the water and somebody holds you under there long enough, you're dead. Water represents death. It can kill you. So we're placing our hand, our life. We're placing ourselves under the 
authority and control and power of the one who is baptizing us. We're humbly submitting our heart and our lives to the one who has us in their hands. You know, baptism is first a demonstration of humble surrender, but it also demonstrates the saving work of God. So Jesus' baptism, he goes under the water and comes back up out of the water, and John the Baptist, a mere man, Jesus has put his life in John the Baptist's hands. And on a whole host of levels, symbolizing and foreshadowing what's about to happen. Jesus is going to put his life in the hands of sinful men who will take his life, who will beat him, and who will put him in a grave. And in turn, we put our lives in Jesus' hands who will bring us up out of death and set us free into new life. It's a beautiful picture of what God is going to do. And so there's this humbling reality to this picture of baptism. But it also demonstrates the saving work of God. Write this down. It's number four. Jesus' baptism, or even baptism in general, demonstrates the saving work of God. Jesus is painting a picture through what John is doing with Jesus for what it looks like for someone to be saved. When Jesus is baptized, John plunges him under the water. Can you imagine the king of kings, not under his own power, submitting to the power of John the Baptist, being plunged under the water? I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's actually a baptism video on YouTube of that little kid who like comes um, off the side and like does the cannonball in the baptistry, and everybody's like, "Woohoo!" I've been in a couple of baptisms kind of like that. It's a little unexpected. I'm not thinking that's kind of how Jesus entered the Jordan. Can you imagine, though? So Jesus puts his, himself in the, in the hands of, G, of John foreshadowing his death and his burial. And then the baptizer draws Jesus out from under the water, foreshadowing his resurrection from the dead. And here's the truth. When we join Jesus in believer's baptism, when people who come to faith in Jesus Christ, when new believers are baptized, we are declaring through baptism that we have joined Christ in his death and that we have joined Christ in his resurrection, that we have placed our lives in the hands of God and he has taken the old life and covered it over and he has brought us up and filled us with the spirit and given us new life to live a new kind of life. You know, Romans 6, 4 section of scripture we often quote when we're putting somebody under the water. It says, we were buried therefore with him, that is with Jesus, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk a new life. A new life. So we're saying through baptism that upon our surrender, God has put to death our old self and is brought to life a new person. God has brought into the world a person who lives for, uh, who lives for and, and lives as Christ in the world. God has done the work to make us little Christ. And through baptism, we're, say, we're declaring externally what God has done on the inside already. People filled with the Spirit of God who join God in the work of unfolding His kingdom. He's brought us to life. Our Spirit-empowered surrender and God's work of killing our old self and bringing us to new life in Jesus, um, here's the truth. It makes obedience possible. And this, this, is the, this, is, this is where the big idea begins to come to life. Write this down. It's truth number five. Jesus' baptism presents obedience as the fruit of true repentance. Jesus' baptism presents obedience as the fruit of true repentance. You know, in verse 15, Jesus tells John why he must be baptized. Read this a few minutes ago, but it says, but Jesus answered him, that is John, he's speaking to John, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. So what does Jesus mean to fulfill all righteousness? Kind of talked about it quickly, but I want to slow down just a bit. He means that he is demonstrating the finished work of the gospel. He is 
being baptized in order to show that in obedience, um, to show that in him, obedience has become possible. It's become possible. It's become empowered. The big problem has finally, at the center of human history in the, in the de death and resurrection of Jesus, the big problem has finally been addressed. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world through their disobedience. Every single one of us, Scripture says, is a son of that disobedience. We are sinful by nature. We are broken. We are hopelessly separated from God. Adam and Eve brought that sin into the world through their disobedience. Every one of us that has ever lived after that was a slave to disobedience, was unable to escape sin, could make efforts in relationship to the law, but failed, and then make some efforts and then failed, and then make some efforts and then failed. We are unable to escape sin and a disobedient heart and life. Man, Ephesians says, Paul says in Ephesians, is dead. He's alienated. He's lost and hopeless in his sin. No hope for us. Disobedience is our life. Hell is our destiny. We're separated from a holy God because of this sin. God gave the Old Testament people the law and called them to walk in obedience, to walk, to surrender to God in faith and to walk in obedience. And they, they surrendered. They would step out in faith, but obedience was hard. It was willful. But as we see in the story of the Old Testament people unfold, we recognize that they could not obey because their hearts were not changed and transformed. They tried and they tried and they tried under their own power and their own willfulness to obey, but they continued to be slaves to sin. Faith in God, rhythm of like judgment and repentance and failure and just over and over. But they continue to be slaves to their sin. But then God made all of these promises to these people as they failed and they struggled and they wrestled with their desire to be God's righteous people. Then God sent the answer to their promises, to their problem and the answer to his promises. He sent Jesus to pay the only sufficient price and to conquer death. And everyone, everyone must decide, will I repent in response to what Christ has done? Or will I just kind of stand by? This is, this is the place, the moment, when we're faced with who Christ is. There's a need for us to decide. The Holy Spirit's at work. He's humbling our hearts. We come to this place. Will I repent or will I stand by? When faced with the truth about Jesus, the Spirit leads us to repentance, to humble surrender. In our surrender, God puts to death what we were and brings to life Christ in us. He does this by, this is incredibly important, putting his Spirit in us. The Spirit who enables and empowers obedience. Friends, catch this. God intends for baptism to be the first evidence of his saving work in our lives. Now, hear me, like, buckle in with me for a second. I'm going to walk a line here for a second. Baptism is not an obligation. Hear me. It's not an obligation. It's a demonstration of the saving work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit who is leading us to obedience. Now, if it's an obligation, we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're like, oh, I got this thing I got to do because Jesus did it. He told me to do it. I need to go do it. That is us willfully choosing to pursue the righteousness of Christ in, in and of ourselves. I'm obligated to go get baptized. Man, it's an option for me. I should go do it. You know, it's a way to demonstrate what Christ has done in me. But those who have genuinely come to faith in Jesus, the Spirit of God has rushed upon us. The Spirit of God has come to live in us. The Word of God is landing in our mind day by day. We're seeing the demonstration of obedience unfold through the life of Jesus in his baptism in Matthew chapter 3. And not because we're obligated, but because Christ's blood has covered our sins and Christ's Spirit is in us and He is compelling us and empowering us to obey Christ first in baptism. And then, beyond baptism, in the life and work of the kingdom of God. Baptism is our first opportunity to demonstrate that the Spirit is on us and He is in charge of us and He is leading us. 
It's the first opportunity that we have to show that repentance was true repentance. And we do it joyfully because the Spirit has brought that desire alive in us. We think, a lot of times we think, I repented, I surrender, I got saved, therefore I need to announce it. And that's true, but we're not just announcing something we did. We're stepping forward and recognizing what God has done in us, and we're responding to, to the Spirit who is compelling us now that we are saved to obey Christ through the waters of baptism. In baptism, we're showing righteousness has been fulfilled in me. When I, when I sit down in that water and I put my life in the hands of some pastor or person who's led me to faith or some person in the church as a representative of God, what I'm saying to the church is, the Spirit's in charge of me. I've been saved. I've repented. The Spirit is upon me. He's in charge of me, and He is leading me into repentance. We're demonstrating a changed heart, an orientation that the Spirit is empowering an orientation towards listening and obeying. Baptism in, is evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you. Is baptism required for our salvation? I think that's a broke question. No, it's not required for salvation. We know that what Christ did for us is what saves us. Our faith, God's grace, our faith in Christ and his finished work, that's saving. But I think... To say baptism's not necessary for salvation discounts something that's central to the work of God. It discounts our first opportunity to show that the Spirit's in charge. And I think that's pretty, pretty stinking important. I think God's Word teaches that that's pretty important. Nobody truly obeys God without a changed heart. Nobody does. But if we have a changed heart, we begin to long to do the things that the Spirit compels us to do. I want to invite you to write this down. I don't know if you noticed, but like um, we're into like number five, and we're like only at like two verses in. So we're going to speed up. i got like three minutes left. Truth number five, Jesus' baptism foreshadows the work of God in those who come to faith. Now, I, I want to open this up and do this really quickly. But I, I love this part of the text. We focused on the part that, like, well, it's the technicalities. It's the part maybe we wouldn't tend to focus on. We tend to want to focus on the second part of this text. Let me read it real quick. Verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, so it happens. Here's what happens. This is fun. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming down to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. I don't know exactly what he sounded like, but in my own imagination, he's more Barry White than like somebody that's got a squeaky voice. Okay? So, here he comes. And uh, the voice from heaven says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Now, it's easy to pass by this. So far, we've taken all of these different things that have happened in the story, and we've recognized that Jesus' obedience is showing us our obedience. It's showing us the way, the way. But this last portion shows fruit. It's definitely an affirmation from the Father to the Son. We see the presence of the Holy Trinity in this moment. It's a significant moment. There's not a lot of moments in Scripture where we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit like demonstrated in a physical sense, like right there in front of everybody, right? So this is a big moment. So there's an affirmation from the Father himself, the work of the, the Holy Spirit himself on the life and work and ministry of Jesus. It's a part of Jesus' preparation or affirmation from the Father. As, the, as a part of the, the, the Godhead, the Trinity. But I think there's things to see here about what the work of God, what the work of repentance, what the, work, what the um, reality of coming to faith does also, not just in this moment with Christ to affirm him, but does in us. 
Think about this with me. Before Christ, the heavens were not open to us. We were separated from the Father without hope of relationship with the Father. But when we truly repent, a way is made for us to relate personally and commune personally with the Heavenly Father who has been in heaven making way and making plans to open this door, this way for us for all of human history. The way that it works, like even prayer, like let's talk about that for a second. The way it works is the Heavenly Father is communicating to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He looks at us, communicates with us, relates to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. When he, when he looks at us through the blood of Christ that we have placed our faith in, God sees the righteousness of his son instead of seeing the sinfulness of our own lives. And God says, that is my son right there. You're adopted. You're my son too. And so through the blood of Christ, God communicates to us and the Spirit is in us equipping us and empowering us and attuning our hearts and our minds to be able to receive the words that God is speaking through the blood of Christ um, to us and the Spirit is making our broken and dead flesh able to hear the word of God through Christ in us. A way has been made. The heavens have been opened. And when we pray, if we were just broke off to the side, We'd be crying out into the air, but God has placed his spirit in us. Those who have repented, the prayer that God hears for those who do not repent is a prayer of repentance. The prayer of those who have repentance is wide open because the spirit has been put in us. We are praying through the blood that we have let, put, placed the, our, our trust in and Christ and the father is receiving our prayers and he's communicating back to us because God has made a way. He has opened the heavens to us through repentance. It's beautiful what God has done. The access we did not have, we now have in, in Christ Jesus through repentance. So God opened the heavens Scripture said he came up out of the water and the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. This is exactly what happens when we repent. The Spirit of God hits us like a ton of bricks. Now, I don't know. Sometimes that's demonstrated in all kinds of different ways, but the Holy Spirit comes in us and he begins to set on fire who we were, like we talked about last week, and begins to set ablaze our lives in reflection of who Christ is. It's the work of the Spirit. He empowers our dead selves to be able to communicate and commune with the Heavenly Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He is our help. He is our, um, you know, he, he is the one that empowers our gifts as we seek to serve Christ in the world. The Holy Spirit does all kinds of things in this brokenness. So the Holy Spirit descends on us in that moment of repentance like he descended on Christ. And he does a transforming work. He brings us to life and he brings who we were to death and he begins to empower life. And so the heavens are open, the Spirit of God falls, and the Father declares, This is my beloved Son. And here's the truth of the matter when we repent and embrace Christ's forgiveness through faith, The heavens are open, the Spirit of God descends on us and fills our lives, and God declares over you and over me, you are my son. You're my daughter. Nothing can separate you from the love that I have for you. You are eternally secure in me because I have become your father. Today I've become your father, and today you have become my son. There is no better news in this entire world than the truth that God has made a way for us as we face who Christ is and we repent, humbly repent. He has made a way for us to enter right relationship with God, to have the Spirit of God fall on us as the heaven is opened and for God to say, you are no longer Matt Tipton. You are the Son of God. You're no longer that sinful young man who did all of these things You are a son of God. You are a daughter of the king, and nothing can separate you from my love. This is the starting place. 
Like you think, at the end of Matthew, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded. I don't know about you, I've been kind of small in that. I can't do that. But you know who can? Christ in me, the Spirit in me. Somebody who has access to the Heavenly Father through the blood of Jesus by the power of the Spirit can do that. Someone who's truly repented and has seen the Spirit of God set ablaze who I was and is the Spirit of God building who Christ in me. That kind of person can walk in the calling of God. That kind of person is saved. That kind of person is saved. Friends, this morning, um, I don't know um, where you came, like where your heart was when you came rolling up in Anchor Church today. If you are redeemed um, I told you at the beginning this morning, when we observe the way, the beauty of the way of Christ, it leads those who are truly redeemed to rejoice in what God has done. To say, yes, look at what God has done. He is setting a blaze who I was, and he's setting me um, on fire to be, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. I have access to the heavenly Father because the heavens have been opened and the Spirit is at work in me. Like, man, if, if you're a Christian today, you ought to sing really, really loud at the end today. You ought to come rolling out of the sanctuary this morning going, yeah, look at what God has done in me. I'm going to go talk to my neighbor. I'm going to go talk to my coworker. I'm going to talk to that lady in the fruits and vegetables section at Kroger around the corner because the power of God is on me. God has saved me. I'm a new person. Let's go. You know, like... We want to worship Christ with our song and with our lives if God's done this work in us. Let me tell you, if you hear a message like that and it's anything but, i got to sing and dance all the way out the door because of what Christ has done. Embrace Christ by faith. Embrace Christ by faith. He wants to save you today. He wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to burn up who you were and set you on fire with who he is. He wants to call you son or daughter no matter what you've done. And he wants to hold you secure forever. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for the baptism of Jesus and what Jesus shows us through his baptism. He demonstrates for us. He's foreshadowing and declaring the good news of the gospel to us. He's showing a picture of the gospel, of, of, of the, the gospel truth. Father, I want to pray for the body of Christ, those who are redeemed that are in the room or watching online this morning. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would keep setting who we were on fire and bringing it to nothing and that your Holy Spirit would continue to bring about by the, the building blocks of your word week in and week out, that your Holy Spirit would bring about the life of Christ Jesus in us. Lord, I pray that we will hear the truths of the gospel this morning as your people, and we would be just invigorated to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ because we too are sons and daughters of God. God, thank you that we can walk in freedom um, that comes in your forgiveness and by your spirit. Thank you that um, we get to walk in it with a new name, um, with a new identity, with a new purpose in this world. Uh, Lord, I pray our worship would reflect the truth of what you've done in us and that our lives would and our mission would as well. Lord, I pray for people in the sound of my voice this morning who are wrestling with whether or not they've genuinely repented, whether they are the Pharisees who've walked in religious practice, self-righteous practice, or they are people who have said, um, bring to nothing all that I am, Lord Jesus. Save me, Lord Jesus. I surrender my heart and my life to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that there would be people in the room that would say, whether they're brand new to church, brand new to Christianity, or they've been here for 50 or 60 years, Lord, I pray that the light of your gospel, the light of your word would um, compel them, that your Holy Spirit would compel them to humbly, not pridefully, but humbly respond to the good news pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you are in the room and you're one of those folks um, who are wrestling with the, the realities of who you are in Christ Jesus, you don't know if you are saved. You don't know if you're redeemed. Go before the Lord today in prayer and say, God, I'm surrendering my life and faith to Jesus. There's people in the room that just maybe just won't even be sure. 
and you want to nail it down today, that's completely fine. Before you leave, if that's the prayer of your heart this morning, I want you to find somebody in the church. It could be me, one of our other elders, anybody in the church that you, you like look at them and they go, huh, they look like they've been around here a minute. And say, today was the day I gave my life and faith to Jesus. They're going to come find somebody and we're going to celebrate and we're going to talk about what next steps for you. Um, we want to walk with you as a faith family as you seek to be surrendered to Christ and walk in the power of the Spirit each day. We want to be a church that does that with you because we love you because we love Christ. Um, let's worship the Lord together. Would you stand with us? Let's sing together. Thank you.
That is a great way to end that word from the Lord today. Amen. All of our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was righteous and faithful, because we have been buried with Christ, uh, raised with Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our hope. He is the hope of glory within us. And so this morning as we go, we're going to go in that truth. Um, we're going to go out rejoicing in the hope of Christ in our hearts and in our lives, in the fact that the Lord Jesus is not done with any of us. <laughs> He's not done with any of us. So whatever you're facing this week to come, whether that's going to be a hard road or a good road, know that the Lord Jesus Christ is with you. He will be with you, uh, whatever's to come this week. So go in the hope of glory, the hope of Christ in you. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.